Welcome to another broadcast of the Deborah Ruffini Show on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are archived. You can find them at artistfirst.com. And now, from England, here she is, your host, Deborah Ruffini. Greetings from England. Uh, welcome to another edi- edition of the Deborah Ruffini Show. Today, it is my huge pleasure to be speaking with a wise, insightful friend who has been a huge blessing to me, um, enlightening me on areas of abusive relationships that I hadn't previously considered. It's great to be speaking with you, mate. How are you doing? Hi, how are you going? Oh, it's good here. Thank you. It's, it's my quarter past 11 while it's a bit later for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, um, it's actually past nearly 6.30pm here. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's, it's so funny, isn't it? It's a funny feeling speaking to someone at the same time but it's not the same time <laughs> it's bizarre yeah we're like living in completely different lives that like you've just woken up and i'm just getting ready for bed <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh dear <clears throat> so how are you finding this quarantine is it is it um how, how are you doing in that it's not too bad actually um i'm keeping myself very busy so i've got like heaps of stuff to do around the house okay. and um you know, I've got my gardening to do. Yeah. And um, the isolation is kind of taking a toll. It's been, I think, just over two months since I've been kind of isolated. Wow, it's a long time. Um, yeah. How about yourself? Are you yeah. handling it well? Yeah, it's. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's it's more the atmosphere that that's odd. You know that that you kind of can't see anyone, but everyone's at a distance, and it's it's almost like something out of a a 1980s futuristic film <laughs> that's it kind of feels like that but um i feel like it could be back in the 80s because the air is so amazingly fresh like the pollution is like on nearly down to zero like i went outside the other night and i could actually mm. see like the shape of the moon and like the stars were like 100 times brighter oh, wow. and um the air like felt really clear and fresh and it was just so nice and um yeah you know, no one was around, it was very quiet, and it just felt really peaceful. Yeah, I bet, yeah, I, th- I think there will be a difference in the, in the, I think it will affect everything, hopefully humanity and the atmosphere and, and um, the universe, which will be good, for the better. <laughs> so, on yeah, a... I hope people kind of like, sorry. No, 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 you carry on, go ahead. I hope people kind of do a lot of, like, self-reflection, like, with the time alone, um, Mm. that would be that would be really good because um i think with our busy lives we kind of don't have time to really you know really contemplate things a lot yes that's true um yeah and we're just kind of like you know not even really realizing we're just kind of doing things every day and active every day you know you come home and you make dinner don't really have much time for much else yeah and um yeah this kind of kind of stops the world for a bit like stops time and um yeah, it could be serving yeah. a purpose, couldn't it? As you know, it's a, it's a it's a bad period, but it could be sort of doing us a favour at the same time, really. Um, it's definitely it's definitely not like a completely hundred percent good thing because it's a pretty tragic thing to happen to the world. Um, mm. But the, the people who do make it through, and um, I suppose we're the lucky ones. Um, I hope it kind of like you know makes us th- rethink things. You know how our lives were lived and yeah yeah just it, i yeah. guess maybe i'm the only one who kind of thinks like that but i just i spend all the time in thinking about things and mm. um you know maybe i've kind of been on automatic a lot rather than um actually doing the things i really love you know what i mean like um yeah like the time you know having lost jobs and the, the extra time you get to yourself you kind of delve into those projects that you didn't have time for before and yeah um yeah yeah that's true no it's that's good to to look at it like that on the on the the plus side yeah but on on a less positive note (laughs) our subject and what we're going to be discussing this is going to be we've done this before on the show but um you know each each um 
every time it's discussed it we have different things we bring up and um yeah the fascinating yet appalling subject of npd narcissistic personality disorder and yeah. um it's an interesting one it's a horrible thing horrible thing for anyone to go through um have you got any thoughts on what makes a narcissist I, i've I've done a lot of thinking about this and I don't know whether it's something they're born with, whether it's a, a if there's a, a narky gene or um, whether they were raised as a little brat, little, little princess and grew into a, a brat or prince or princess. What do you think about that? Um, I've heard so many different like opinions and also professional opinions and you know, as a criteria that people can diagnose people with NPD and and all this stuff and from mm. my experience um I tend to assume someone's like, like I, I guess I, can't, I was kind of exposed to narcissism in a way that wasn't very cl like um was very messy like I kind of just was kind of shoved into that world and had to kind of figure out you know what was going on while I was inside it and I wasn't really you know, prepared to kind of, you know, deal with people um, who were mm. abusive. And yeah. I kind of see a narcissist as someone who just doesn't really care. Like, you know, they, and, um, you know, as someone who's like more empathic, you kind of so desperately want them to care and so desperately want them to be like you. Mm, yeah. And I guess you just came, I guess it took me a long time to kind of come to the acceptance that, there's people that literally just don't care and, you know, it's not in a good way. It's not like they're carefree or, like, you know, laid back or something. They actually just do not care and they're solely out for themselves and <coughs> they, um, you know, go for, go for great lengths to destroy people's lives in order to get some sort of gain or, you know, in order to not be exposed or something like that. And yeah. I guess that's what I call... A narcissist, someone who doesn't doesn't care or, or lacks a lot of empathy, or and um, to, to yeah. people that I'd be more concerned about would be people that kind of seek out people to kind of abuse and seek out, you know, seek out victims, and I think they call it supply. You know, like they kind of gather people around them to kind of you know achieve some goal for themselves. Yeah, and um, I guess that's what I, I call a narcissist, and um. The, mm. the term narcissist is very kind of new to me because, you know, I just, um, you know, I, I did, it's kind of weird, like, labelling it, you know, it's kind of strange, like, putting a name to that kind of label to an abuser because originally you didn't see them that way. Like, you, I guess when you grow up, you're kind of not aware of narcissism as a term and you kind of just develop this kind of opinion of someone that you, you fall in love with or that you care about and you never really thought that it would be come to that and it'd have to have this label for them mm. <laughs> but um yeah i, I guess mm. narcissism i just say the basics of it you know someone doesn't care someone who does harm usually deliberately or you know has no remorse for their for hurting people um yeah. Yeah, and I guess I don't see narcissism as someone who you know loves themselves in particular, or someone who likes their you know likes their appearance or something. Or cause I think I think that can be kind of a strength, you know, liking the way you look and taking care of your appearance is kind of like a good thing sometimes. But I see yeah. more narcissism like as a real thing as someone who lacks a lot of empathy and you know causes harm. Yeah. <laughs> and doesn't really care about hurting people. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. That's um, <clears throat> been uh, my own personal experience that backs up what you know what you read about it as well. But it's 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 hard to believe that there are people that exist who honestly feel no sense of remorse or conscience, isn't it? Because your average person does, even even if they're quite hard and thick skinned. But it's just. Unless you've met one, it's hard to believe that they really do exist, isn't it? And I wonder if they know what they're doing half the time. I, th I think some deliberately hurt people, but I wonder if others are just, oh, well, that's just my nature and I don't know. It's 
I find it an intriguing subject. The whole the whole thing I find very fascinating. It's so fascinating, and it's so hard to accept. You know, even when you're even when you're being treated so horribly, it's so hard to accept that that person actually doesn't care. Yeah. And um, you know, you kind of you make so many excuses for them, and I feel that the excuses that you make for the person that's abused you is the same excuses they're making for themselves, except right. they actually can never accept it in a way and. Um, I'm not sure it's black and white. I'm, I, I also believe that, you know, there are abusers out there that, that are conscious and realise, but, you know, they, they choose to continue doing what they do. And there are people who are completely unaware and, um, you know, have a whole lot of just... Um, their psychology just has a heaps of excuses and heaps of, like, you know, kind of illusions that they kind of believe. Yeah. And they just continue to perpetrate and just kind of make these excuses and um you know back up their actions with with lies and yeah you know stuff like that because they they either don't want to see or they don't care to see or they never really thought about it and i've also heard the the from someone that they actually just don't have any like capabilities of self-reflection which means they will never realize what they're doing because they never they never look at themselves like they never they never look into the mirror like they literally never look at themselves and that concept is so foreign because you know empaths are usually huge self-reflectors they're usually constantly like you know thinking about what they've done and they have like a big conscious and Mm. um they're self-doubting themselves and constantly kind of like reevaluate their actions and everything and to like empathic people um the concept that someone doesn't realize what they're doing or doesn't care it's just so it, it just boggles the mind sometimes like it just you just can't understand it yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's it isn't it it's you just sort of yeah it's hard to believe is i i find the lies quite an interesting i mean you quite often the lies are just lies of a five-year-old you know, you know really ridiculous lies that no adult is going to believe but sometimes we do fall for them yeah. And um, you know it's um, but it's it's interesting because it's a bit like when you think of the boy who cried wolf. You know, no one came to his aid every time he cried wolf, but there was that one last time when he cried when he was actually being honest. And I feel it's a little bit like that that you know sometimes when we least expect it, they are honest, and then we don't believe them. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Don't do themselves um, any favours. It's so hard because it's so hard to also draw a line between an empath and a narcissistic person because, you know, everyone tells lies. Like, um, you know, it, I'd be a liar to yeah. saying I've never told a lie because I've told lies yeah. before. But I think when you draw the line is when you tell a lie and it's harm someone in a way that, you know, is not beneficial to them. And, yes. you know, hurt them and you don't feel any remorse for that lie and, you know, you, you continue to lie and continue to harm them. I think that's the danger zone for narcissism. I think that's kind of going into the narcissistic zone because that's showing, you know, you, you don't feel bad and you don't feel remorse and you, you want to cover up the fact that you lied mm. and you refuse to kind of feel insecure and feel kind of this, this weakness, some people say, it of like, you know, realisation that you've done something wrong and I think that that feeling and that kind of step is really hard for narcissistic people to take because they never want to admit they've done something wrong. Like no, no. They, you know, they continue to lie and they continue to like you know abuse and and take advantage of people. And what makes them a narcissist is they they refuse to to see that. I think that's what kind of defines narcissism because they think everything they do is okay and is acceptable because. They may, I don't know, they may, like, think themselves as high, highly, like, higher beings than other people, you know, like, what mm. I say and do has more importance than, than your worth or you as a person. Yeah, so. Yeah. But, like, it's so hard to draw a line because everyone lies, like, you know, you know, you can't, I wouldn't say lying is narcissistic. I think you go into the narcissistic zone when, um you know, you start to not feel remorse for it and you start to not feel guilt for it. And um, if it was yeah. a, like a 
pretty like significant lie. I mean, not like you know, not like not like lying that you ate a donut today or something, or yeah, lying that you you're telling your friend that you lost weight or something when you didn't. Stuff like that is is kind of white lying, and it's it's not really like causes huge harm to people, but like no, um. The bigger lies, you know, like if you're in a, in a relationship with someone and, you know, you're lying about seeing other people or you're lying about your feelings and stuff like that that becomes toxic, that's probably narcissism and I think that's where the, the danger zone, that's where you go into the danger zone of narcissistic personality. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. There, there's a big difference between, I mean, like, a, um, I always think child's art is, is a good example of a white lie, you know, a, a kid draws a picture of a, a balloon and a a face on the balloon so look at his mummy so oh that's really good that really looks like mummy so, no it's rubbish it doesn't look anything like mummy <laughs> <laughs> but you can't you know you can't say that a bit like um jim carrey and liar liar if you if you were that ultra honest it would you'd be offensive but i think yeah i think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. a big lie is when um, so someone deserves to know the truth and they're not deserving uh, sorry they're not knowing the truth where they where they deserve to know the truth. Yeah. That that's a different thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think lies can be a defence and protect you as well. But I think narcissistic people take it to a greater extent that they protect their insecurities rather than just you know their privacy or something. And um, you know everyone's yeah. entitled to privacy and stuff like that. But you know if you kind of you know you're in a relationship and you're, and you're cheating on people and you don't actually care about the person that you're in a relationship with and you know, you're not being honest about your feelings and that that's a bit that's really toxic for the other person it's also toxic for you so yeah i think that's like that's definitely a way you draw the line yeah that's it isn't it it's um always always justifying themselves as well isn't it? They, they can be presented with concrete evidence of the truth and they'd still say no nah, you, you're, you're imagining you're seeing that or <laughs> you know so it's yeah, very very sad I think that gaslighting is really dangerous um, oh, don't. for the receiver, yeah. like, because I think that's another, um, like, a, probably definitely narcissistic, um, like, thing that narcissists do, like, I think if you start to gaslight people and, you know, you kind of, you're aware that they're, then they're becoming, you know, they're, they're not getting healthy or they're going insane or they're going crazy or they're worried and you're not, like, easing their pain or easing their kind of, you know, questions and things like that and, then that's definitely yeah. narcissism because you know you, you think your actions and your life is more important than someone's sanity. And, um, yeah, yeah. It's. I was reading the other day where there was a. <clears throat> I don't know if it made international news, but over. I've mentioned it before in one of the shows. Um, in the UK, there was a. Mm, this happened in, for about two decades. Fred and Rose West, they were a, a married couple. What made this interesting is that they were a married couple and the young girls that they took in to be their nannies, um, you know, were trusting them. Because what, what could go wrong? It's, it's Mr. and Mrs. West. They're a lovely, you know, nurturing couple. But they had basically, um, they used to grab young girls that were runaways or, that, yeah, that they'd run away from care homes. They were people that, young women that wouldn't have been missed, put it that way. So they were very manipulative in how they used to get these girls and who they would, would target. And one of those young girls was, I don't know how, she was a teenager. She was called Linda Goff. And um, Fred and Rose had just murdered Linda Goff and quite often they would behead these girls and dismember them. They were, you know, very, very vile character characters. And Linda had written home to say, oh, I'm staying with this nice couple at famous address, 25 Cromwell Street. And um, so they just just murdered her. And Li Linda's mother turned up at this address and said, oh, my, my Linda's written to say that she's staying here with this nice young couple. And uh, R Rose West had answered the door. And um, and Rose said, no, we don't know, we don't know of anyone called Linda here. And uh, Mrs. Goff looked at Rose's cardigan and said, oh, I, th I think actually you, you, you're wearing Linda Goff's, car my, my daughter's cardigan. And Rose was still, you're completely insane woman, and shut the door in her face. And Mrs. Goff was walking away, still thinking, oh, that, that there must be some mistake. You know, it's my mistake. And that, that's a good example of gaslighting, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, they just don't care how, yeah. 
that's definitely definitely narcissism. <laughs> and I think that's a probably really malignant malignant um, evil narcissism, and that's what yeah. scares me because you know when I meet toxic people who are kind of like you know small fry, you know they don't yeah. murder yeah. people or anything like that, but they they gaslight you and they they play with your emotions, and it it just scares me. I get really scared of those people because. You know, then you hear stories like that, and it just makes me think: What are these people capable of? Like, you know, yeah. um, how how far will they go to kind of achieve something? You know, or you know, feed their egos or feed whatever they're feeding. I don't know. Just you know, whatever that couple, Fred and uh, Fred and Rose, was it? Yeah, Fred and Rose West. Yeah. Whatever that couple were trying to gain from that, I have no idea. I can't wrap my head around why someone would do that. And um, you know, I just yeah. And I get maybe narcissists also get to the point where it's the point of no return, you know, like they've done something like that and they have to continue lying because, you know, that they want to keep living the life they're living and they don't want to get caught. Yeah, um, I think that's it, isn't it? It's it's um, part of it, I think, is the power, the, the power trip that it would give them what, whatever form their evil takes. It's, it's getting that power and control. And also, I think... Um, so I've I've known four in my life. I've had two um, ex partners. One uh, <laughs> another person. <laughs> I just realised I can't say it. Um, and a former friend, and um, and that they've all been like relishing in how much we can pull the wool over someone's eyes. It's all been very much a rush and almost like an addiction to do it. Mm. And you think, you know, it's. it's Get a different hobby because there's there's other things that you know. <laughs> have some chocolate. That will give you a rush. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think I think um, what you're saying before is really important because I get this kind of feeling, and it, I'm not saying that like I'm super old or anything. Like I'm not super old. I'm kind of like middle aged or young to like young mm-hmm. adult, but still a bit like on the older end. Yeah, and I feel like this kind of air around people these days, not necessarily young people, but also a little old people as well, that, like, you know, being narcissistic and being evil is kind of, like, a cool thing to do. Like, oh. you know, like, it's kind of a really, like, um, part of the community and everyone, like, you know, kind of talks about, um, you know, oh, I made this person feel like shit today. I'm so awesome. And, and um, oh, right. I guess, like, it's kind of intoxicating. Like, being evil is kind of intoxicating. Like, there's even like mm. pop songs that say, you know, why does it feel so good to be bad? And, you know, it, yeah. I think human beings are kind of like, think evil is kind of really easy to do. Like it feels good for some reason to some people. And, you know, it's like intoxicating and attractive. And, um, yeah, it just, yeah. it seems, it seems like it's very glorified in a way. And, um, I feel, you know, people who do perpetrate are kind of backed up by a lot of other people in the community and um yeah i have a feeling that's why it, they've stopped because there's a lot of other people like them and it's kind of increasing well i don't know if it's increasing but i feel like there's you know a lot of people who are narcissistic and you know it, it's kind of becoming like a norm like you know and um and that's scary yeah it's just it's pretty, yeah it, it's very scary and it's very scary for like empathic people because um, I myself feel like I'm outnumbered and, um, you know, I feel like I've, I've stepped into a circle where I'm, like, fighting, like, ten different people at once, you know, like, because, like, there's yeah. only, like, one of me and, um, I, I feel like, a, you know, a lot of empaths may feel that they're very lonely or, like, you know, just, just might, you know, can't beat them, join them kind of attitude and, and, um, I guess, I guess I try and, like, spread awareness and try and, like, kind of be... I don't know, kind of more active in communities to try and say that you have a choice. You don't have to be like that, and you can you you can choose to be empathic, and that's that's awesome also. And it doesn't mean you're not cool. Doesn't mean like you know you're not good enough or whatnot, or like you're not having as much fun. And mm. um, yeah, I feel like a lot of abusers kind of drill into an empath that like being an abusive person is the way to go, and you know, being an empath is weak, and, um, you know, I spoke to this one person, and they were saying that, you know, all the good people in society always um, get the low end, and, you know, get the short straw, because, you know, everyone just kind of gangs up on them, 
And it makes me mm. think that, like, empaths are even kind of choosing to either not speak about it, not do anything about it, or choose to, like, be narcissistic because it's the easier way. And and um, there's, there seems to be, like, more of a community of narcissists than um, you know, empathic people, in my experience, anyway. Oh, Christ. That is sad, isn't it? I think that's very... That's quite worrying. Yeah, I I think there's... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think there's um, more out there. Like, I could be. I could be. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, I could be wrong. Like there could be like heaps of different people out there that I haven't met yet, and maybe I'm just attracted to toxic people. That's why I keep finding them. But um, I feel like mm. what you said about that person that you're talking about that they, you know, they try and gossip. You know, like it's almost like a gossip about you know they did this to that person, and you know they they played a game with that person, they won, and it's all about winning and. Mm. Yeah, this rush and stuff, and I feel that's very intoxicating. A lot of people kind of fall for it, and um, you know, it, yeah. it seems like it's kind of the fun way to live life. You know, don't care about things because caring about things equals pain and you know hard work and all this kind of stuff. And people don't want to choose that because they want the rush and the you know the euphoria of like being powerful and yeah. yeah. But it's like it's like the wrong path because you know they're turning themselves into. A really ugly person and they're not really realizing what they're doing and and um they you know keep thinking they're awesome or whatnot and i don't know it just does, i don't understand it no <laughs> i guess i guess like um yeah it'd be interesting because they do have interviews there are narcissists on online who actually people interview narcissists and actually try and like you know try and find oh. out you know how they think and stuff and all right there oh. is one man who who willingly actually speaks to people, I think it was on YouTube, he actually goes to, like, seminars and speaks to people, and, and there's, like, empaths in, in the audience, like, you know, blowing their eyes out and stuff when he tells people what he's done, and... We. Oui. And, um... Yeah, he actually he willingly goes and speaks to people when it admits that he's a narcissist, and... And, um... It's actually really interesting. I'd, I'd actually kind of like to go to one of those seminars and actually talk to a narcissist and, and ask, you know... Yeah. Why do you choose that kind of life, you know? Um... Because to me, it just seems so foreign and, and like infathomable. Infam- like I just don't get it. Yeah, I see. They they can't be happy people, can they? I mean, if if they were truly happy with themselves, they wouldn't want to. That they must be self loathing deep down. Yeah, I've heard that as well. But who knows? Like I've never been inside a, a narcissist's mind, so you know, I, I assume that you know they have some problems that they need to deal with but I think in a way if you've been evil for so long that those problems become so buried and you almost become like a completely different creature and yeah and um you know you, you can even even kind of lie to yourself and, and say you don't have a problem and you know you've kind of made yourself into this thing and um your problems are so buried so deep that it takes a lot of you know a lot of um I don't know who can break you out of that because you know to, to tell someone, to make someone realise that they're evil and they're hurting people when they don't have empathy was, like, nearly impossible. Yes. Um, yeah, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Like, they've buried that empathy and that human part of them so deep that it's so hard to actually, you know, actually bring them back down to that or, you know, I, I don't know, like, yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I think it's, um... Yeah, I don't... I think... I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of, I think with my own, that they, they've had, I mean, we, we hear, oh, narcissists don't feel anything, but I think I think they do have massive feelings when it comes to them. You know, they kind of, they're, they're, they're very deep feeling when it comes to jealousy, they're very deep feeling when it comes to uh, anything connected to them, doesn't it? I mean, like, if they're... Well, I don't know. I was going to say actually, but I haven't thinking about it. I don't know whether it would be the case. If if they had a pet that died, I wonder if they would feel because it's still their feelings that they'd be upset over. But if if their partner's pet died, they wouldn't be feeling for another person's pain, would they? No, I don't so, think they. I, I doubt that they actually feel empathy. You know, because if they felt empathy, then they it that would cause them to stop doing it. You know. Yeah. Um. So, I don't know, like, I've read so much about this and, um, you know, there's no real way of, like, you know, 
telling what you know a narcissist person's brain looks like without you know pulling their brain out and people used to do that in the olden days you know like um you know cut people open and stuff and and scan their brains and and um, now we have like mri and stuff like that but um they're back i think a while ago i think i read a book um what was the book called i can't remember i'll tell you later but um Mm. And people did scans on people who they suspected as psychopaths. Oh, okay. They did a lot of testing on psychopathy. And um, the people who tested positive for the psychopathy kind of traits, the scan showed up on their brain that, that their um, structures of their brains are actually um, different to, like, other other people who scored differently on the tests. Oh, right. And um, their brains are actually a different structure and there's parts of the brain that were missing or, or incredibly smaller than um than the other people and um <coughs> yeah it's like it's like a whole different kind of like not a species but a whole different kind of like you know like um creature that they were because they just their brain structures were different like you know wow. they're different size past their brains different sizes and and um yeah, like they did lots of testing about, you know, they got them to play games and and they got the, you know, the other people like control, um, you know, groups to play games and, and the results are really interesting and um, the psychopath um, type people, you know, they tested that they had no fear and, you know, they, they, don't, they don't care how many times they lost, but as long mm. as they won, you know, once. Oh. So this is, from, this is an extract from the book. Um, I wish I could find the book for you. Um, mm, that's here we are. I'll, I'll tell you what the book's called, so I won't, so I can credit the author. But um, okay, yeah. it's called "Taming Toxic People" um, by David David um, Gillespie. Gillespie. Okay. And um, toxic people. Make a note of that. It's really confronting book if you've been through abuse because it's quite hard to get through. But um, mm. he also he mentioned all this research that people have done in the past and. The psychopaths, they played this game and, um, you know, you had to ring a bell mm. so many times and um, when you got the, the right answer, you got a reward. And the oh. empaths, they only rung the bell when they knew it was the right answer. So when it was the right answer, they got the reward, but they didn't actually press the bell when it was the wrong answer because they knew they wouldn't get the reward. But right. <laughs> the psychopathy people would constantly ring the bell, even if they knew, you know, even if they knew it was the wrong answer, because, um, you know, they'd try and, like, enhance their chances of winning, and, you know, they get they get one win out of, like, you know, ten false rings, and they just don't, don't care about not getting that kind of, um, <coughs> that reaction from the bell, and mm. um, it, also, it also kind of related to how psychopaths are kind of, are very powerful because they they're very kind of not really good at business but they kind of they they're generally in the business world because they don't care if they lose like they're not scared of a business failing right you know that they'll, they'll deliberately run businesses into the ground and not you know not be scared of the consequences and i think that what this book was saying is that empaths are less likely to be in those positions because they have a lot of fear and you know, kind of conscious around the business failing, it's very stressful for them. But like, you know, a psychopath, they don't find it stressful because they don't care if it fails. You know, they, oh, wow. they'll they run a business into the ground if it gave them some kind of other gain, you know, like, yeah. they don't, like, they think completely, they think in a kind of different, like, platform than empathic people. Oh, that's and, interesting. Um, yeah, I guess that was really interesting, that book. Yeah. That's some... And, um, I think they should still actually. And, um, so, ha- sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Sorry to to the viewers. There's a little bit of a delay. We're not we're not deliberately interrupting each other. There's just a bit of a delay. Where we're talking to each other. Just... <laughs> <laughs> we're not that rude, are we? We're not doing that. <laughs> I was just going to say. I think we ought, we ought to still be allowed to cut the brains out of narcissists out. To be honest with you. <laughs> Be nice. Yeah, that's a, a lobotomy. Do that now. We have we have MRI now, so I'm sure that they can still you know scan people's brains and stuff. And 
But you kind of have to yeah. do it willingly. Like you, they can't like pick you off the street and scan your brain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Was that a lobotomy? I think that was called a. Was it a lobotomy? They used to go through the nose or something. I think. But I'd, I'd maybe call something oh, else. Oh, that's horrible. I've seen pictures of that. I'm not. Oh. Not sure, like what, how they actually did it, but yeah, they used to remove people's parts of their brains in in mental health. Like it's horrible. Oh dear, it's um, amazing what they used to do then. They used okay. to remove the frontal lobe, which is like your personality and your judgment. So people who had that part removed just kind of became zombies, you know, and very compliant. Oh. And um, yeah, they were kind of just like drones, you know, like had no like kind of thoughts of their own. And um, dreadful. Yeah, it was it, that was really bad. But what you were saying about, um, what were you saying before? Um, mm, what's that? I can't remember why I got into that, that oh, talk um, about the psychopath brain. But um, yeah, yeah, why they why they choose that kind of life? I think, I think, I think mm. psychopaths who are born, perhaps they're born with like these brain structural differences. Right. They don't really have a choice. Like, like, you know, empaths are born empaths and. Psychopaths are born psychopaths. They don't really have a choice. They're just who they are, you know. And and I guess that's what's yeah. scary is because empaths kind of wish the world, you know, was or empathic and you know everyone was like them. And and it isn't really because psychopaths do exist. And um, you know, you can't change them. They just they they are who they are. Yeah. And um, but I think narcissism, sociopathy. I don't know whether the line draws. Like I'd probably have to do more research and maybe even gain some more personal mm-hmm. experience, but I, I can't tell, you know, the difference between a narcissist and a sociopath. Mm. I, I perhaps kind of categorize psychopaths as people who are kind of born that way and they have, you know, they're just, they're just like that. And I find them the most dangerous because they they definitely don't have any feeling. And, and like you're saying about narcissists, they perhaps do have feeling and for themselves. They're just incredibly, like, maliciously selfish. And, yeah. um, you know, I've had... You know, the reason why narcissists, you know, react the way they do to your criticism and to, you know, you trying to expose them is because they are emotional and because they are insecure, which is an emotion. Yes. And they do get jealous and they do have these kind of emotions and you know, they do feel bad for themselves and, um, you know, they're, perhaps they're a different kind of a fish than a psychopath. Because I think psychopaths are very, they're more very like, um, they kind of react different ways and. You know, a psychopath can kind of mimic emotions, but they don't actually just, they're just a blank slate. They don't have any, um, except for perhaps maybe short-lived emotions like anger. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? It's 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 funny because we don't, we don't really know who they are because it's, because they're different cattle of fish to us. And um, because there's so many lies and... And looking back, I, I mean, I only realised this recently that any, any friend that I've had or um, or partner that has had either a, an illness or maybe something that has gone terribly wrong in their early life, I'd always felt sorry for and really felt for. And then when I met a narcissist and I'd heard another, yeah, not ma- making light of it, but a sob story, if you like, there was something in me that thought, I can't feel for her. Why? Why can't I feel sad for? Her? And I felt really bad about it for a long time. And I realised, um, like I say, quite quite recently, the reason I couldn't feel bad for her is because I didn't know whether it was true or not. And that's the thing, isn't it? That you you don't always know what to. You can put certain behaviours sometimes down to certain things, but then you think, but I don't know if it's a lie or not. And the person that came after me, two, 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 sorry, that, I don't mean that angry, <laughs> two months after me to, to be with this person, she was given a completely different life story. So, you know, it's quite often we don't really know who the narcissist actually is. Um, I think that's kind of part of their game as well. That they've kind of, they kind of spun that web so it keeps you guessing and, you know, that you can never believe anything and it keeps their stories kind of open to create whatever they want. Because even yeah. if they do tell you the truth, you'll never believe it. So no. they kind of continue this game, you know, with themselves and with other people to kind of like create whatever personality they want to kind of get get a reward from someone. And um, 
Yeah. The same thing happened to happened to me. I, I'm pretty ninety percent sure I was dating a psychopath. And you know, after mm. three years, you know, three years of trying to get him to admit who he was and what he was doing to me, mm. like he would choose like the the right in the right times in the way that you know he would know my emotional response to what he would say, and he he would say things like you know I can't love. You know, he, he would admit that to me and oh, say. Right. I can't feel love. I can't love, and and in the moment he kind of manipulated me to kind of react a certain way because his manipulation was running very deep constantly. And mm. when I kind of got out of it, away from it, and I realized my authentic reaction to that would have been intense fear and disgust, and you know, wanting to run away from it. But yeah, um, and you know, I couldn't. You know, I was so conflicted because I couldn't feel sorry for him because. I sometimes even try and second guess myself saying, you know, can he not feel love or is he just manipulating me again? You know, like, yes, yeah. and I guess that's part of their game. You know, he admitted that at the right time when I was already hooked. Because, you uh, know, if he told me that, you know, at the start, it would have been a very scary thing. And I would have been like, oh, that, that's weird, you know, like, and yeah, but like, because I had a long term relationship with him, I had developed this kind of bond and, you know, lots of experience with him and spent so much time with him that, you know, it made me actually think about it and consider it like as an important thing. Um, sure. I think that's kind of part of their game and especially the very intelligent ones. They're very, they're very like quiet. They pick and choose when they tell you things and, and they have a reason behind it usually. Yeah. And, um, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And, it just it just confuses you. Like, it totally just confuses the victim or the survivor or whatever until they just completely go mad and they never really know the answer. Yeah. And um, I think that's kind of part of the defense, you know. They just never want anyone to really know who they are. And Yeah. Yeah. But also, going back to this whole love thing, I think, I mean, I found that it's not that they don't also, apart from not being able to feel love, I feel they don't want love. They just want kind of cheerleaders and, and worship and admiration and, it, you know, which is quite a different thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it's a different emotion. Like, I also read once, I'm not sure if it's true because everyone does research and you never know, like, if it's going to be discredited later on or there's something new would have been researched. But I read something lately that... Um, so what was the question again? I just forgot. <laughs> yeah, no. I was, I was oh, just, yeah, that's right, yeah. That love, yeah. Um, what was I was going to say. Um, I think. If you say you're approaching middle age, I get this all the time. <laughs> it's a middle age thing. Oh, I, I get, like, I get <laughs> blanks all the time. It's so bad. Um, um, something about they research. Also, they, they don't want to They want to feel like they want admiration. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Um. Yeah, completely. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. <laughs> Move on. No, that's all. No, that's all. No, this has happened so many times. It's, it's, I, th I think also because of the subject matter of what we're talking about, there's lots of aspects to it, and there's lots of things to talk about. There's lots of things to take in, and we're sort of going off on a tangent on different things. That that's how much they get us. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're saying, <laughs> and it happens with them. Yeah, I think of a memory, and I'm like. Oh, yeah, and that happened too, and that kind of goes into the subject, and then it kind of takes on a different path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. Um, do you think there's... Um, I often wonder how two narcissists... Would, would two narcissists just clash, do you think? Could a narcissist be in a relationship with a narcissist? I don't know. Like, I, I think it's possible, and I think... Um, there are marriages that are kind of arranged between two narcissists to kind of um, achieve a goal. Oh, right. Um, so, yeah, like a lot of marriages aren't out of love and a lot of marriages are kind of arranged and, um, you know, kind of personally arranged. Like, I guess back, like, many years ago, it was kind of arranged for, like, you know, economic status and, and you know, land and, and money and stuff like that. But mm. I think these days it's kind of personally arranged for similar types of things, you know, like for wealth or, you know, to kind of like form an alliance or form a team and to achieve a goal or something like that. And I think that's very possible and it probably happens a lot. And mm. um, I think analysis can kind of, you know, coexist, but I have a feeling there's always a dominant and a submissive one. And um, 
I think if there was two dominant ones, then it probably clashed heads too much, you know, like, I think one person's kind of calling the shots and the other person's kind of, you know, supporting the cause. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's some stuff. Yeah, that's good. Now, you mentioned, when we spoke before, you mentioned a term I hadn't heard of. Um, was it dog whistling? Yeah, dog, dog whistling. What, I, what is that? Yeah, um, someone told me that recently. They mentioned the term, but I've known the concept for a long time. Oh, right, never heard of it. Um, never heard of it. No, um, it's a new one. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a really evil thing that abusers do. Oh. Um, another evil thing. <laughs> not yeah. list, but yeah. Um, it's. Mm. Did you want me to explain, like? What yeah. Have you thought, like, yeah. Experience or... That's right. Yeah, because it's never been explained on the show because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my my understanding is it's when you know you spent time with someone who is abusive and they have learnt something about you, like learnt an emotional trigger, or you know, it, it's kind of like um, a upside of an inside joke, like yeah. and. You go into like you know either uh, an online setting where there's other people around, or you know like you could even be alone with them, or it could be like around a bunch of people at a party, a gathering, you mm. know, even one more person in the room, and the the abuser would kind of say something that emotionally triggers you, and you know could trigger some thoughts or could trigger some emotions in you to kind of abuse you in a, in a way that makes you feel you know like crap, not just like crap, but kind of you know tampers with your mind. It's like psychological abuse, right? And um, to the other people that are listening, it seems innocent. Mm. You know, um, I'm trying to think of an example. So say like, you know, it's probably like a, a simple example would be like, you know, um, say like you were trying to like desperately lose weight or something and you're quite overweight and, you know, like mm. your mother or your father was <laughs> always very like, you know, um, they were okay with that and they'd tell you when you're alone saying, it, you know, I love you forever you are, whatever. Yeah. But then, you know, when you're around the dinner table with, like, your other family members, the, the mother would say something like, you know, oh, I would never have two servings. Like, who would do that? Like, you must be like, you know, who, who likes overweight people? Like, they're so oh, this right. and that, you know? Yeah. And it's kind of like a dig at, at you, and but it's not direct. And, you know, for everyone else in the room who may not be overweight may think it's like an innocent statement, you know, like who likes being overweight, not me, you know, and everyone yeah. kind of thinks it's like innocent and something, you know, that doesn't really have any problem, but, you know, like, and then, but the, the mother or the father, the, the narcissist or the abuser has been telling you behind doors that, you know, they don't mind you being overweight and they, you know, all this stuff, but then they've said something different yeah. um, in public or around other people that's kind of like taken a jibe at you. All oh, right, that's interesting. That's yeah, that's a completely new one on me. That's that makes sense, and I think I think I've probably witnessed that with with one of the narcs that I've known. Yeah, they're horrible, aren't they? Yeah. They're just <laughs> they're just <laughs> horrible. <laughs> I mean, stating the bleeding obvious, but they are just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah i know it, it it really sucks but they do exist and you know we're not in control of that which really sucks as well but yeah um i guess all, all we can really do in our position is kind of raise awareness and kind of get people to know the warning signs and not get involved with them and um but that, that's nearly impossible because there's so many people in the world and um yeah yeah <laughs> Wouldn't it be interesting if, if you had a whole list of all the different terms? So like projection, dog whistling now, gaslighting, um, all, all different things. And you gave them a summary, like the guy that you mentioned that does the, the lectures, and you gave them a summary. And you said, right, are you aware that you do all these things or a vast majority of them? I wonder if they would wonder what the response would be well yeah so or whether it's just no i don't do any of that <laughs> it'd be interesting wouldn't it yeah they could deny it. they could be like yeah whatever like i think i think some abusers have just kind of they, they don't have any emo, emo feelings so they just kind of admit they're whatever you know they can say they're whatever and they don't really feel anything like they yeah. could admit they're a piece of shit they could admit they're this and that and it doesn't really make them feel anything like they don't really like no it's, it's hard for like people who have a moral like 
compass to kind of wrap their head around the fact that someone doesn't have a moral compass. Like they just they see the world completely different and they think completely differently. Yeah. And um. Yeah, like you know, they just they just don't they don't care about how people see them because they don't really have that moral compass. Like they don't really want to do good or help people or you know feel good or anything because they don't really have that you know. Yeah, that yeah. want to, they have the ability, you know, it's just weird. And, um, it's hot, yeah. Yeah. It's the, no, nasty. And sometimes they, they want um, to have different reputations to different people. I think because they they can be living multiple lives, two different, wanting, wanting to, to, to show themselves as different people, this, this disguise that they use and being masters of deceit. Um, I know with mine that she had about four different lots of people that she wanted completely different reputations for, and you think that's just how can you keep up with that? That's completely insane. <laughs> it's it's strange all round. It's just it's not just evil. It's surreal. The whole thing is. Well, they must have some sort of drive that keeps them going. And I think that kind of goes back to the point that they do have emotions or, or some sort of feeling, you know. Yeah. Like they must have some sort of drive. And, and you know, because if you didn't have any feeling at all and you're completely dead inside, why why do you keep living? Like, you know, why do you choose to keep being around? Yeah. And um, they must value themselves in some way and value their life in some way and have this kind of drive, you know. And, um yeah yeah it's, it's like where there's a will with a way i guess you know if you want to achieve something you can and and the the mind is like incredibly powerful that you can pretty much do whatever you want and in in a, in a narcissist mindset a narcissist's mind i guess they they can if they want to achieve that and if they want to you know you know have two girlfriends or three boyfriends or whatever on the go then they can achieve it because that's what they want and that's what they do i guess yeah oh i hope i hope there is um justice somehow at the end of it whether it's in this life or whether there's another life i do hope they do not get away with it you know it's because it's, it's the, one of the most horrible things is knowing that they're just living carefree and ruining destroying lives in the process and they're not getting caught some of them get caught but but i think it make it makes the um, survivors feel better knowing there's some sort of justice, isn't doesn't it? <laughs> Hopefully there will be. Yeah, it does because empaths love justice and empaths love doing what's right and we love the truth and and you know we'd all we'd all all our survivors would love to see our abusers, you know, um, not get punished but at least you know get revealed and so people would stop you know buying into their games and into their their bullshit basically. Yeah. And um. Something that really scared me was the the psychopath that I was dating. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not diagnosing him, but I'm pretty sure he's a psychopath. And um, he mm. he was like really scary because it made me kind of think that I just needed to let go of all this kind of wish for justice because he, you know, he'd say things like, you know, if he went to jail, he wouldn't care. You know, like he. They right. literally have no sense of punishment or no sense of fear. Wow. And um, that really scared me because a psychopath, you can never really punish them. Like, and, you know, even if, like, you damage them physically or even if, like, you know, they sent them to jail, you can never really punish them. Like, their games just never end. Oh, and, um, goodness. I guess that's why they had the death penalty when in the, like, a few years back because they would, you know, they would actually hang or electrify you know, serial killers and people who are extremely dangerous. Yeah. Because you can't you can't re rehabilitate them because they don't they don't have any kind of emotional feeling or that kind of like human kind of condition that requires them to re feel remorse or like you know give give a survivor or a victim that kind of satisfaction. That they're, they're never going to give you that. No. They're never going to turn around and say you know. I'm sorry, or I'm punished now. I feel bad, or show any kind of pain because they they'll never feel it. Like it's mm. really scary because you can never really punish some people, and and um, you know, it, I guess some like narcissists or people you know who may have different kind of um, you know, psychological makeups. People actually feel feelings. The, the way to punish them, you know, because they actually have some sort of 
like remorse or guilt or whatever going on but some abusers actually never feel anything and you can never punish them and like it's very scary for survivors and victims once they get involved because they can't really ever escape from their games because it never stops oh my goodness that is very very sad oh my goodness oh it's been great to chat and it's some thank you for your enlightenment on on this issue and uh yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for being a blessing to me as well, because you, you came to my rescue, didn't you, when I w- wanted to <laughs> clear something. And, did uh, I? Did I rescue you? <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. I was having a, a bad day. And, um, yeah, to the audience, my, my beloved friend here, uh, yeah, um, I heard heard something that she said that j- I should have heard at the time, but it, it blessed me um, a day later. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that. Thank you so much for that, sweet, and um, really appreciate having you on. And to the audience, uh, thank you for listening. And if there's anything that's been said here that sounds all too familiar, you are deserving of so much better. No one should suffer at the cruel hands of um, NPD. And uh, until next time, lots of love and God bless. (laughs) 